Actually, oh, there we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. My name is Maddie Hornsby. I'm the project manager for the Riot organization. And welcome to the Riot Lunch and Learn series, the place where we spotlight our Riot sponsors. Today we have with us John, Paulo, and Eddie with Amplify Labs talking about startups to Fortune 500, approaching software accessibility. Just a couple quick reminders before we get started. This event is being recorded and will be posted to Riot's YouTube channel and uploaded to the meetup page where you registered for this event. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to throw those in the chat and we will be monitoring the chat box throughout the presentation. And John has said that he is happy to answer those throughout the presentation. And then please keep yourself muted throughout the event. With all that being said, I'll pass it over to John. Hey, John, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Maddie. Uh, my name is John Petit, and uh, myself, Paulo Reek, and Eddie Bianco, we're going to be talking about navigating software accessibility today. Um, I am co-founder and CEO of Amplify Labs. Paulo Reek is co-founder and CTO, uh, and Eddie Bianco is our chief design officer. And both Eddie and Paulo are going to be showing me up by giving presentation in their second and third languages today. So, um, yeah, I, I get to be the one that uh, doesn't look quite as good. So navigating software accessibility. Before we get into that, just to give you a little bit of background about ourselves, we are Amplify Labs. We're essentially a software product development shop. Um, we work end to end. Um, we have designed machine learning uh, and uh, application development teams. Our goal is to be a one-stop shop for um, anyone who's building a software product and needs a solution around that. So with navigating accessibility, we're going to be talking about basic history, then some basic stats. Uh, Eddie's then going to discuss accessibility in design. Paula will talk about an engineering perspective, and then we'll summarize all of that into answering the question of what do you do as a business? How do you approach this as a business? So one of the first instances of um, accessibility and thinking about um, how do we improve the lives of folks who have disabilities? What, what can we do as a society around that? Arose after World War I in 1918 with the Soldiers Rehabilitation Act. And what was happening was soldiers were coming back from World War I. They, uh, many of them were disabled in many different ways. Um, they were given uh, financial support so that they could live and survive, but it became clear that financial support wasn't sufficient to provide a real life for someone. So the Soldiers Rehabilitation Act aimed to give purpose and fulfillment to the lives of soldiers who were disabled in the war. So it provided training and opportunities for them to um, contribute back to society with jobs and in ways that were fulfilling, right? You can think about it as fulfilling to the spirit, to that aspect of humanity that's beyond food, shelter, and basic needs. In 1973, the uh, Rehabilitation Act um, was similar. Um, it was uh, it was aimed at, a key section of it was actually aimed at making the new telecommunication systems um, that were coming online accessible. So it did a lot of different things, but a key part of it was uh, making sure that telecommunications were accessible to all folks. The American Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, as you may know it, that's sort of what we think of as the quintessential piece of legislation that dictated that you cannot discriminate against individuals based on a disability that they may have. And then in 1996, it was clarified that uh, the ADA also applied to digital, digital content. So the internet, computer software applications, et cetera. And approaching more present day, even though 1999 isn't really present day anymore, but 1999 was when um, the WCAG 1.0, so those are guidelines around accessibility on the web, they were first introduced and the goal was to create a standard around 
internet accessibility. And then in 2014, this is not necessarily a milestone like the others were, it's just an example of what's going on today. So in 2014, Material Design 1.0 was released and it had accessibility guidelines and standards that Google wanted implemented or recommended uh, be implemented when using the Material Design specification for their mobile apps. So this is an example of specific specifications that are also being uh, provided now by say Apple um, or Google or other major platform providers. Um, there are some other standards that are trying to be put together right now by the World Wide Web Consortium, not just for the internet, but for mobile, um, but they're not quite done yet. Let's look at some basic stats. With regards to disabilities, one in four adults in the United States have some form of disability. Right, so that's 26%. And one in four is quite a few. That means some people in this call right now have some form of disability, one, one quarter, just, uh, statistically speaking. And there are many different types of disabilities. And sometimes one thing that we don't actually think about is that disabilities can come and they can go. So about, I'd say maybe seven years ago, I actually ended up with tendonitis in my hands. And it took me probably like two years to try and figure out how do I work in my daily life? What do I do so that I can work on a computer, right? This is like my primary job. Okay, I'm learning code, I'm writing code. And if you can't use your hands and you're writing code that presents some interesting challenges. Um, so eventually I figured that out. Okay, I figured out the stretching that I needed to do. I figured out um, my daily routines so that I could manage that and it wasn't an issue. That's a form of a temporary disability. Right? So, so disabilities are not necessarily what we think of them as far as somebody being blind or you know, somebody being in a wheelchair. They can come and they can go. So when it comes to digital accessibility and software accessibility, the primary one that we think of, Eddie's gonna talk a little bit more about that, but the primary one that we think of, and for good reason, that would be vision, right? And so 4.6% of adults have some sort of visual impairment. When we extrapolate the numbers from the CDC and the census, the US Census Bureau, um, we find that about three to 5% of Americans, so about three to, five out of 100 uh, folks have some sort of visual impairment. And that's quite a bit. So if you think about all the folks you know, you probably know quite a few that are visually impaired. Another very important stat is that folks who are over 60 have a very high density of disabilities and impairments compared to the rest of the population. And it makes sense, right? You're getting older. The number of folks over 60 as a percentage and as a discrete number is going to be increasing quite a bit as the populations of industrialized nations uh, age in general um, and as the population of the world continues to increase. So in 2030, we're looking at 1.4 billion people who are over the age of 60 and in 2050, 2.1 billion people who are over the age of 60. And this, let's think about it from a business standpoint, right? This matters because that means the number of customers that you have, or you could potentially have uh, that have some sort of disability are going to be increasing. That's important to know. And with that, Eddie is going to beautifully with fantastically beautiful slides, as he's the chief design officer, going to be discussing accessibility in design. Yeah, thank you, John. Hi, everybody. So yeah, for me, the first question we need to answer is why? Why we should care? Like there are ethical, legal, and business reasons 
to prioritize accessibility, and Nicola assess the digital services for everyone. So in my section, um, I focus more on the ethical side and why it is of special interest for designers. Let's put it this way. Everyone should have the equal ability to use your product, period. Whether it is a mobile application, a game, or an online shop, or any kind of website. Um, in the last 20, 30 years or so, we've been working on inclusivity, removing physical barriers to allow people with impairments, such as supermarkets, government buildings, workplaces, leisure places. So we started designing things differently, with more inclusivity, with empathy, uh, taking into consideration the perspective of people other than ourselves. So let's, let's take a, a quick look at barriers in the physical world. One of the most spread solutions, the acoustic signals for blind people at the traffic lights, wasn't even designed. It was found by accident. Uh, in the first decades of the previous century, traffic lights were using sounds because people were not accustomed to the switch between the green, you know, green, orange, green, green yellow, and red light. So a bell alerted them. Then someone realized that blind pedestrians would benefit from such a device. And yet we needed 70 more years maybe to start adopting this technology systematically worldwide. But actually it's less common than one would expect. I mean, in many cities, if you're blind, you don't have this privilege. But the thing is that I mean, being treated as a first-class citizen, is that a privilege or a birthright? One day, someone, a uh, genius probably, finally stopped thinking about this. Like people uh, in a wheelchair will need a ramp or an elevator to be self-sufficient in a building with stairs. So we started designing differently. You know, we started designing ramps. We started designing accessible elevators. Now let's run a quick exercise for empathy. Uh, I'd like you to think about the most simple activity, like going to the grocery store one block away to buy your favorite box of cereals. How long would it take to get there? Pick the right one from the shelf, pay for it, and go back home to have breakfast, like 10 minutes maybe? Now imagine doing the same, but blindfolded. Just close your eyes for a few seconds and picture yourself locking the door, going downstairs, walking for half a mile, crossing one avenue, and finally reaching the store. This is already challenging, right? Now, how do you know where your cereals are located? And how do you recognize that box that you like the most? You'll need to ask someone. You're not independent. You're frustrated because you can't accomplish a simple daily activity. In the last 20, 30 years or so, many physical barriers have been removed, but many are still there actually. Now, if we take a look at the digital world, we realize that we still don't have ramps. We are in the early phase of this change of paradigm. We're like 30 years late or more. That's why people with disabilities still have extremely frustrating experiences with digital products. There are many examples where these problems happen, much more than one would expect. Let's take Facebook, for instance. I'm not sure if now it's fixed, but until some months ago, you could not comment on Facebook with a screen reader using your desktop browser. They optimize the mobile version, but not the desktop one. You know? So no consistency, no ramp there. And this is anywhere. I recently came across the experience of a blind user that wanted to buy something online. So she went through all the processes of browsing the online shop, selecting the right item, placing it into her cart with a screen reader, which is a time demanding activity. So after 20 minutes, she realized the size 
the site was not accessible in the very last bit, uh, the payment set. So she changed the browser, did it all over the game, same result. Frustration rising, right? Changed computer, went from Mac to a PC, same story, more frustration. Finally, she tried the phone. Guess what? It worked. More than two hours wasted like that. So if we want to design a satisfactory experience, we have something to remember. If you integrate third parties plugin in your project, you need to certify from the start that they're accessible as well. On all platform, on all browsers, or you force users into this unpleasant situation. So now let's talk about what can we do. Of course, on a practical level, comply with regulation and meet requirements, let's say for WCAG, A, AA, or AAA. We need to follow all the right guidelines and run accessibility tests, but that's not enough. Since Don Norman invented usability and human-centered design, as designers, we want to start with the needs and abilities of people, because that, that's what we do, right? We need to be sure that our content is actually usable by real people. We cannot design a knob that needs some weird and unexpected maneuver to open a door. Otherwise, we could be the only ones able to enter that room eventually. So same for digital products. We want them to be inclusive. We want to provide a seamless and fulfilling experience to any user, not biased by the way we perceive things, which is visual mainly. So back to empathy, while designing with accessibility in mind, we have the power to help anyone to be more successful in life. If a person with impairments can take advantage of our digital product or service to be self-sufficient in managing, let's say, his or her bank account, working remotely, or having fun with a video game, then we did a pretty good job. So how to do that? The first, the first answer will be understanding the user's needs. Does it feel like too much to think about it? Well, we just work step by step and don't rush to a solution. So we start from this. We have four types of disabilities. Blindness, which includes low vision and color blindness. Hearing, cognitive and motor impairments. The good news is that designing with blindness in mind gets you 80% of accessibility issues solved. So that's a very good start. This is because blind user will use a keyboard. So you can test keyboard access, which is what mobility impaired user will use. When we think about hearing impairments, so we have deafness, uh, we have hard of hearing. So we need to work with captioning there. And that's pretty straightforward. And then we have cognitive issues. They are a little bit more complex because we have various, various problems, various issues like dyslexia, AD&D, Asperger's, and all those things. So usability and UX play a fundamental role in accessibility. They require you to be thinking about screen elements, the way a user with impairments would. And, and we are not used to it. It's very tricky to think that way. Just look and listen to one minute browsing experience of a blind user. Please increase the volume a little bit uh, to listen to this video. Harris, friendly. Paris 2018 left here in the photos right here in colon top 20 Paris vacation rentals, vacation homes and condo rentals dash in Paris, I circumflex le dash d dash France, France colon Paris vacation rentals and apartments in Paris. Okay. Paris 2000. So, found places in Paris. Apartments in Paris. Banner, main navigation, banner in Paris, main region, dates menu unavailable, sub menu use JAWS key plus or plus M to move to controlled element. Guests menu unavailable submenu use JAWS key plus or plus M to move to. It's menu unavailable says 
Dates, guests menu unavailable sub menu. Home type menu unavailable sub menu. Guests home type menu unavailable sub menu. Use price menu unavailable sub menu. Instant book menu unavailable sub trip type menu unavailable. More filters menu unavailable. Add listing to link house with terrace in Paris. Quite impressive, right? I mean, it's scary because we are not used to it. They actually have to scan through each item of menu, each item on the page, and the screen reader will speak loud what it found, what it finds in a in the alt text, for example, of the images, and in, uh, in the bottom text. So if you're not used to it, and they they actually listen uh, with the speed, like it's two or three times the the normal speed to be more effective to be. A, uh, because it, would, it takes so much longer to scan a web page with this technology. So this is just to give you an idea of all the effort that needed by a blind user to see what we design. So now let's speak about um, classic accessibility good practices, like alt text, for example. Alt tags are classic classically overlooked like they're often ignored or misused. They should describe literally what's in the picture when an image provides informative volume. Like in this uh, example here, it describes exactly what's in there. And if the image is simply decorative, then we should still write the alt tag, but leave it blank. Another important item uh, is focus order. We really need to design focus. We need to design how clicking the tab on your keyboard, a user should be able to navigate through all the key elements. So we need to be aware also of grouping, grouping uh, elements that are uh, similar, that are closer in, in a way like number four or five here uh, in this example. So they the, the screen reader doesn't jump on number six before reading four and five. So we have really to think how a blind user would scan all the page elements to find the relevant content. So I have a, a clear idea of how go, it goes on navigation, bits of information, links, and actions. We have to use a correct a hierarchy and semantics. And this is simple, but not obvious. Like design and use semantically correct <clears throat> HTML5, uh, it's, really, it's really important. It provides all the right tags to make your content accessible. The header tag, the nav tag, the section tag, the footer tag, they're all divs, but HTML5 helps screen readers identify what those divs are for. So it's must do definitely. And also it's very important to never misuse the headings. The H1 is the first level always. Then we have one or more H2, one or more H3, and same for H4, H5, and H6. We really need not to skip any level because that will create a huge confusion for user, users relying on uh, screen readers. Another very uh, complex issue comes from hamburger menus and pop-ups. Like these dynamic elements introduce some really problematic issues because they make suddenly visible some content that previously was not on the page. So if I'm a blind user and I'm scanning like we heard just one minute ago, I'm scanning through all the items on, of page, items on a page, um, I may completely miss this new bits of information that I'm popping up. Or if they capture the focus, they will break my flow by speaking loud their, their content in a way that doesn't make sense to me because maybe I was you know, scanning through the navigation. So I can get lost in the page and I will need much more time to recover from this shock. you know. And especially when you see some website that have many cascading pop-ups, I could be lost in a, in a loop, you know, I could get stuck there for, forever. So luckily for us, we can use ARIA tags to announce their dynamic contents that needs my attention or to silence down some content that we don't need to be announced. And also in a design phase, we need always to uh, 
we need to remember always to provide a safe way out, you know, with a clear close button or by clicking the S key. All of these needs to be defined in the design phase. Now the delicate item are uh, complex infographics. We need uh, we need this to be readable, but they are not readable by default, like complex images, infographics, maps. It's weird because uh, there's something that for a sighted user provides information in a very immediate way, but cannot interpret it by, by screen readers. So we need to add some text only descriptions of these visually complex contents. And finally, another very important point is that we need to test with actual users with disability to find the gaps. For example, a simple online chat application will be for a blind user almost three times more difficult to use. So automated testing tools that check contrast or check for any WCAG related issue are great but you need to check real life interactions. A testing tool like JAWS or Way is not telling you how hard is it to move on the screen and complete the required actions. Another point to take into consideration is zooming. We really need to never disable zooming because user, users with a low vision they may need to, to use it up to 400%. So it's never a good idea to block it in any way. And also we need to test what happens to our designs when uh, we zoom in like that. For example, we may have some um, model content uh, completely cut or partially hidden by this zoom. And we need to be aware of that as on a similar, uh, way we need to be aware of what happens to our designs when they adjust uh, a, a smaller screen or by version. So we really need to check out um, if any element, for example, moves out of the screen. And so we really need to be careful with this. At the end, uh, I think that we really need to, to build like uh, assess attitude. And this means to think about people first, always. We need to design for differences, to build assets from the very start. These are the golden rules to achieve that. So use standards and check them, you know, fix all the HTML errors, size and contrast issues, all, all the things that even automated tools can help us to do. Create easy interactions, and this is uh, done by you know solid work in UX. <clears throat> Make your product act and function in expected ways. Design clear navigation. Always we need to remember how that is almost three times as hard to navigate a website using screen reader. Use plain language, like avoid acronyms or academic words, simple sentence. You know, it's better for screen readers and also for people with cognitive impairments and, and offer alternative formats. You know, audio, video with captions, infographic and maps with text on versions of data, all of that will really help us move on in the right direction. And now, uh, well, I have some final considerations. The, the key point for me is that accessibility is good for all. How? It provides you know, a better experience to all users and in any condition. So we're speaking here about all kinds of impairments, all degrees of impairments, but also, as John said earlier, also about elders or people tired after a long day at work or people with temporary impairments. You know? All these individuals will benefit from this attitude. And besides all these ethical aspects, we've been talking about, uh, um, which I hope convinced you already to adopt accessibility as strategy for your future projects. As a side note, we need to mention that accessibility, even more than usability, 
impacts SEO, enhances your brand, drives innovation, and extends market reach. In fact, by using semantically correct coding and designing better navigation, you allow people to enjoy the interaction, spend more time using your product or service. They'll be happy to do that and associate the positive experience with your brand. When we make graphical information searchable, for example, all graphical information, Google likes that, so that's a ranking indicator. Screen reader testing, for example, can also help you figure out what's missing from your SEO keywords. So this is actually really interesting. While designing with accessibility in mind from the start, making your project inclusive and allowing all users with no, ex uh, with no exclusions to use them seamlessly and have a satisfying experience, you'll be improving the quality of life of the users and at the same time, the overall value, performance and market reach of your product. So it's a win-win. That's all from the designer's perspective. Thank you. And now let's see with Paolo how to use technology currently available in the most correct and efficient way. Right. Can you see my screen here? Yeah. All right. So uh, looking from a engineering engineering perspective. Paolo, we might be on your other desktop. Uh oh. Just one second. I'm pretty sure I selected the, the other one. Oh, man. How do I change it? All right, so let's, OK. Sorry for that. No problem, Paulo. All right. The demo gods go. always find one. <laughs> yeah. Now we can, you can see the right one. There right? you go. There OK, you go. cool. So from a, an engineering perspective, um, so as always, we start with a plan, right? So as Eddie mentioned, the focus control, the navigation using keyboards are very, very important. And this is something that you can not easily adjust after you have an application, for example, right? So you first plan how to build something then you execute and then you we validate and we will follow this structure here during this presentation here all right so we have some technical goals right so the first one would make would be to make the content readable from a screen reader right so i am just like mentioning a few of them so for example on mobile devices, we on Android, we have Google TalkBack as like the native one. And in iOS, we have VoiceOver. It doesn't mean that you can, you can install other ones, but those are being shipped with the operational systems. In Windows, we have the Windows Narrator that is also that also comes with the operational system, but we have like a huge list of options here. Some, of them are paid, for example, and VDA. Some of them are, then are very, very expensive, right? In, in the thousands of US dollars. Uh, we can also have screen readers directly attach it to browsers. So for example, we can have plugins, just one reference here is Chrome Vox, and we can ev even have websites where you type an, another URL and this website extracts all the information, all the meta information from, from the, the application, the, the web application and reads like a screen reader. So also in the, in the open source area, the most prominent one is Orca, which is, a, is part of the GNOME project, but there are not too many options on, on the Linux side of the force. So what, what we, I want to show here, so there are many options of screen readers and they work differently, right? So for example, voiceover gives a different type of feedback to people 
compared to Google Talk, but bo both are mobile. And they, they, they have a very different user experience, right? So all of them, like at least if you are developing for mobile, most likely you need to, to test with voiceover, Google Talk back. For desktop, you need to always create, including your plans for which screen readers you will test your application. Right. So this all this information here, so all those readers are very depending on the platforms, right? The next technical goal. So some of the things that I will mention are overlapping with the design phase as well. So for example, color con contrast. This is specified in the design phase, but who will implement that is the technical team, right? So they need to be aware of the of the contrast ratios that needs to be accomplished, right? So it needs to be at least 4.5 by one contrast ratio. So that means your foreground needs to have a sharp definition compared to, to your background, right? So you need to see the the borders of your components easily for example on buttons right uh so we on on amplify we use figma which has a plugin and does a lot of those validations but we still need to validate these on the qa phase right and how to do this this is the gold standard uh tool to check color contrasts so uh, maybe we can share this, this presentation here with you later, but we have some links here and you can click and navigate here as well. So also internally, we use Tailwind CSS or Tailwind React Native, uh, which is makes it very, or very, I will not say very easy, but easier to, to apply different like, group of colors. So I can easily specify a new prim primary color and that applies automatically to the all application, right? So all the buttons are changed automatically. So by having a good plan on color palettes in general, it shouldn't be a big challenge to implement these consistently across the, the application if you have a good, good plan, right? So plans are the key for everything, as you can see. Also, another thing that affects the contrast radio is font sizes, for example. So people need to be able to read content. And depending on the size of this content, it can be easier or harder. So this is also calculated here on the, on the contrast checker when you run an anal analysis. So another, another technical goal of implementing accessible software is dealing with optimal sizes. So people need to click on errors. They need to click, in, most likely in mobile, right? So people need to tap somewhere and they, they need to find, for example, that there is a button in a specific region of the application. So to make it easier to people uh, with, visual disability, the recommendation, the recommendation is to make all the content, interactable content, bigger than 44 dips. So dips is a different thing from pixels, for example. So that means density independent pixels, right? So you most likely need to, if you want to fully understand how it works, the way to calculate the, the dips or how big something needs to be in terms of pixels depend on platform. So you have a different way to calculate it on Android, on iOS, and on the web. So web is, there is a, a direct correlation between dips and pixels, but in the other ones, as you have different screens with diff, different uh, pixel densities, right? So you can have a, 
uh, a mobile phone with a way higher pixel density compared to another one, a simple, simple, more simple one. So that depends on on the platform and how officially Google on Android deals with this information and iOS deals with, with this information. So this is also a link here and there is a table here. I don't want to go too much into the details here, if, but if you are curious, you can find it here. So for mobile applications, we'll, we'll talk about this soon, but the, the, the recommendation is that it, the clickable areas are at least 48 tips. Right, so this is not in any official standard yet. This is more a recommenda recommendation from Google on the documentation of for the material design. So John and Eddie already mentioned WCAG, right? We will cover this now in a more technical approach. So the first thing to mention is that WCAG is more a guideline and WCAG means Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, right? So it's not a rule or kind of is, and we'll, we'll discuss this now. So for private companies, it's more like a gold standard, right? So, so WCAG says that the law says that federal agencies and their contractors needs to conform to WCAG. For private companies, the law says accessibility is required, but it doesn't say how, right? Or which standards need to be follow, followed, right? So, but anyway, WCAG is the gold standard and is the right way or the right path to, to implement, to create software, accessible software, right? So even if it is for a private company, use it because this is the best and more acceptable, wide, widely accepted standard for, for the accessibility. So also web WCAG, it, it contains in its name web here. So wait, is, is it just for web or is it for mobile as well? So it was originally created for web and it, it, it's, it is created by the, the W3C consortium, but all the concepts behind it, they apply to mobile as well. Right, so WCAG committees are creating a new set of standards, let's say, to, for mobile, and this is, they have some drafts in the internet. In internet, you can find this information, but they are not official in any way yet, right? And there are some what they are working on now are adjusting things to the reality of mobile, which is different, right? So. For example, in general, in mobile devices, you have smaller screens, you have touch screen, or that means you don't have a, a physical keyboard in many situations, right? And virtual keyboards, they can have different layouts. So let's say in a mobile device, if I want to type numbers, I will pre be presented to a keyboard with just numbers. If I want to start to type an email, I have a keyboard for this. If I have, I want to type a any text information, then I have the default keyboard. So the, the virtual keyboards, they change depending on the case. And that can be also challenging for people with visual disabilities. So in general, mobile applications are more challenging to interact from people with disabilities, right? And just answering the question here, so if, if, if WCAG is just for web, yeah, you can use the, the guidelines for mobile as well, right? But there is a combination of, so, so probably if you want to, to implement 
accessible software, you should probably take a look on also on the material design recommendations for accessibility. And yeah, they have a great material there. So let's talk about the most common problems on web apps. So as Eddie already mentioned, semantic, following semantic components, it is very important, right? It, it makes everyone's life, life easier, including the devs. But this is not a, a, a reality. So if you just check any website, you'll see that there is a lot of mis, mis, <clears throat> misuse on, on terms of tags on, on HTML, right? So, but this is the starting point to create web apps in, a, in the correct way. Another, another thing that happens pretty often is empty links, right? So links that goes nowhere or no alternative text or links. And this is a big one. So all the images need to have a description for, uh, so for accessibility, right? So people click on the image and there is a description on what the image it does, does, for example. So these descriptions are very commonly not proper to describe what should be, what, what the image is doing or what is its content. Another one is bad code structure. So making it in some cases almost impossible to use a keyboard to navigate. So Eddie used a, a, an example previously of a model. Right. So there are cases where no matter how much you press your tab key, you'll never focus the, the content that you want. So people will never even see that there is a, a, a model being presented that they can interact with. <clears throat> so the most common problems on mobile apps are kind of close to that, but lack of alternative text on items with no semantic description. So as a company, Amplify Labs likes to use React Native, right? So for example, React Native, you don't have, for example, a button element in the native React Native implementation, right? So you need to implement yours or use a external library that has a button. So that is usually done using a, a touchable opacity component, for example. But if you use this tag here on, on the touchable opacity component, accessibility row, and then say it is a button, then the screen reader will understand that this is, is, a, this is a button. So in mobile development using React Native, uh, you probably want to Treat as you do on the web, you, you need to use all the semantic tags. Here you, you need to specify for each component what, what is its accessibility role. So that, that goes, for example, for a header, that goes for a, a search uh, component. So the list is pretty, pretty extensive. Another problem is badly structured code in mobile applications. So luckily, let's say that uh, React Native uses Flexbox uh, strategy for, for everything in terms of layout. And that prevents some of the possible problems that occurs in, in the web applications, right? So it is more a straight approach on how to implement things. There is less freedom to implement layouts on, on mobile, but also that gives us more reliability that the, the order of things are, are the order that they should be presented to people with disabilities. So another problem, pretty common problem is the small interactable areas. I, I, I already mentioned this one, no tags for videos, icons and images, low contrast, and one that is special, especially challenging in mobile is focus control, right? Because people tap if they don't have a keyboard attached to it, right? So they need to tap 
they need to understand where is the what the focus is doing, which area of the application is doing what, and kind of memorize this information, right? And let's say after a a content is loaded from the API, you probably want to shift the focus automatically on the mobile side to the content of a, of a table, for example, right? So this is kind of more challenging on the mobile side. And on the QA process, right? So what is, what is the QA process to validate? So Eddie previously mentioned like having people Real people with disability, that is for sure a, a great thing to do. Um, but in the basics here, what every, everyone should be doing is using automatic, automated accessibility scanners. Just one reference here is Android accessibility scanner that checks for contrast, if all the, all the necessary tags or, and, or area are present if the, the organization of the content is acceptable and if margins and clickable areas are big enough to be interactable. And then running a manual, manual analysis that will test for different screen readers. So that is a manual test. There is no way to get, get rid of this, this phase. Follow semantic markup. So, so checking the code if all the markup is, is correct in general, and then test keyboard navigation. Right. So this is the minimum to that every company that is releasing accessible software needs to do. So we Amplify Labs, we are creating a, a new library of components called Amplify UI. Uh, so it is a still a work in progress. And this library is very based on Tailwind CSS, which, which makes easier to apply new things to applications. So, but we have a, another goal here, which is probably the main one in this case. So the key concepts of asset accessibility are being implemented inside a component. So for, just for example, an image now in the most recent versions of this library, there is no option but specifying a tag, a, a description for the image. You need to do that. And, and the, the li library is forcing people to, to do this now. And I, I could uh, mention many other, other examples here. So just to keep it, it short, so clickable areas are, are also implemented for components like checkboxes, radio, radio buttons and things like that. So feel free to try it if you want. It is open source and we are more than happy to share this work with anyone. All right, so I'm handing it back to John. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Paulo. Let me bring my screen up. All right, so Eddie did a fantastic job of taking a look at accessibility from a higher level, from a design level. Paulo gave a great um, brief examination of the complexities of implementing accessible software from a lower level. What does all of this mean when it comes to making business decisions? So we're going to take a look at it from an angle of the point in a business's life cycle that you're at, or you could say size. Now, each industry and market is going to have its own idiosyncrasies and be slightly different. Um, so take the numbers and one size for what they're worth, uh, but we're just gonna use it as, as a guideline and a roadmap here. So we'll look at startups first. Now, the cold hard reality is that startups are hard. Right? You have to make hard decisions. You don't have the luxury of doing anything that you want at any time because you may not exist in three months, six months, or 12 months based on the decisions that you make today. So that is the baseline that we're looking at when we're thinking about accessibility as a startup. It's, it's just the cold, hard truth. Right. So as a startup, you're trying to survive. When you absolutely need accessibility, 
is one, when you're well-funded, right? Get it out of the way, get your processes in place, knock it out because it's less expensive to do it upfront than it is to try and do it later, right? So if you're a well-funded New York, San Francisco, whatever big city startup who's rolling in cash, just get it done, okay? If you're selling to the government, you have no choice. They will force you to do it if you're going to be selling to them. So you have to do it. You need to work that into your plan. And if your customers require it. So let's say a significant or all of your customer base is composed of individuals with specific types of disabilities. If that's the case, obviously you need to implement it in order to be successful in your market. When you have to make hard choices or when you're bootstrapping or very poorly funded, there are, it's not uncommon to make choices where it's like, I'm gonna spend money on this today uh, versus I give my team another couple months of runway in which they can feed their families, right? That's, these are real decisions that startups have to make. And another interesting scenario is if your platform is challenging. So video games, there are things that you can do. Video games is just an example, right? There are things you can do to make video games successful. For example, um, many first person shooters will allow you to put on high contrast mode or something where for folks with red, green, uh, color blindness, colors and characters are changed and highlighted to make it to, to make it easier. But there are real challenges around trying to make a completely accessible video game for everyone. People are working on it, right? This is just an example of where the platform means that in some circumstances, you're gonna have to make tough decisions. Let's call it medium-sized business to 11 to 100 people. Your main goal here is to survive legal challenges. Get yourself legal protection, right? Let's say you're a startup. You got a product out there, a miracle occurred, you got product market fit, people actually care about what you're doing and you have customers. At some point, unless you get accessibility under control and you make it accessible, you're going to get sued. I was just talking with a startup, I think like three weeks ago, where um, I think they had 50 employees and they had like just passed through the point where uh, so they were sued because their software was not accessible. So you're gonna to wanna to work with specialists, perform audits, conform to regulations. Uh, that's your baseline, right? Like make sure that you can protect your business and start on your road to completely and well done accessible software. If you have a product that has high iteration, so you're putting out many iterations of your software quickly, this also could be the time where you're gonna to wanna to update your QA and design processes to make sure that you're not just negating any accessibility work that you did in the past and wasting money, right? You wanna make sure that new work you do is accessible and it meets your requirements and what you need. When you're larger, you're gonna be aiming to grow your market share. So this is where you're starting to think about there's, there's a market out there, right? We, as a startup, you're thinking about 80, 20. Once you hit a certain size, you wanna move beyond 80, right? You, to do that, you want to make sure that your processes are in place, they're documented, they're easy to follow, you can update them and modify them as time goes on and as it's necessary. Um, you, this means that you're probably going to want to dedicate some sort of resources to accessibility. Um, these folks are like who anyone goes to at any time that they need to discuss or talk about accessibility. This is a, at least a key focus for them. One way to think about it is previously you got your legal boxes checked, right? You're safe. Now you need to think about how can we make a user experience great? How can we make this experience great and take it to a new level? And then if you're super large, right? If you're, if you're one of those big boys out there, you should be thinking about how can we innovate in this space? Investing in research, investing in your accessibility teams. Because as Eddie mentioned, this is not the end of the road. Not all problems are solved. This isn't something where you can go out there, look at a checklist. And if you check all the boxes, boom, everything's fantastic and the world is great, right? This is kind of just the beginning. So there's a lot of work that's left to be done in various areas of accessibility. And uh, if, you're, if you're large enough, that's what you should be investing your money into. Thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate you hanging out with us and learning about accessibility. And we're happy to take any questions. Thanks, John, Paulo, and Eddie. Wonderful presentation. I learned so much.
So that was really informative. Um, I definitely invite any folks who are still on the line with us to unmute yourselves and ask the team some questions. Yeah, so John, while we're waiting for people to become a little less shy, what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you? Uh, they can go to our website at amplifylabs.com or you can um, shoot us emails. Our emails are literally just, you know, john.petit at amplifylabs.com, paula.reek, eddie.bianco. Okay, cool. I was in a presentation the other day and they said that you have to wait at least six to 12 seconds for <laughs> anybody who potentially might come on, but that's okay. No problem, no worries. Cool. It looks like we've got Rhonda Lund, Sammy Braswell. Okay. Oh, the last one, no? Oh. Nope. Okay, no I think problem. we're probably good to go. Well, we'll let everybody get back to their Wednesday. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. And thanks for your time, Amplify Labs team. Yeah. Have a great rest of your day, y'all. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you.